Hello, hello everybody. Welcome to Life on Life's Terms. You got Kenny here, and it's episode 48. Uh, today we're going to be talking with a good friend of mine and a mentor about a story of reform and re rehabilitation, uh, some charitable work that he does, and his uh, self-care plans to keep him on the straight and narrow. Um, his name is Mike Ryan, and he's a fantastic individual. Uh, before we get into the show, though, I want to give a shout-out to Liam Connolly at Connolly Law. For all your Canadian law, will estate, and media issues, Google Liam Connolly. And we have a, uh, a sponsorship from Legion Boxing Team. Uh, they're putting on a big event, a charity event, in Leduc, Alberta, on November 17th. Uh, they're going to have a dinner and a fight. Uh, it's pretty cool event it's something that we're going to uh you can buy tickets at llc 2018 at legionboxing.com that's where you buy your tickets for this event so let's get in the show here uh mike how's it going good uh it's a real pleasure to have you on the show today uh so why don't you go into a little bit about yourself so we can uh give the listeners uh an image to draw of who mike ryan is well, I'm in my 60s. Um, I've been around the substance abuse world for 52 years. Oh, wow. Uh, I started as a youngster at 13, and uh, I quit actually using 30 years ago, but I've been working in the field of uh, what everybody else calls addiction um, for about 28 of the last 30 years. Um, I run a charity uh, full-time. I also run a, a consulting business that deals with inmates at the Edmonton Remand Centre and other remands across the province. Um, um, I'm a widow. I lost my wife last year. Sorry to hear. Um, yeah, it happens. Darn that cancer. Um, you know, the reality is, is life is good. It has its ups and downs, but uh, life is generally good. Uh, I don't like living in the city, uh, so I live about 50 kilometers west and uh, on a nice acreage with a, a house that I built myself and started way back in the early 80s and still not finished, but that's kind of the way it goes. The fruits of your last 30 years doing service work. Yep, yeah, you bet. So why don't we uh, go back into your, into your past? Like, Where did you come from and what did, what did you do and what brought you to creating that shift? Well, at 13, I was uh, a young hockey player with a big future. In a matter of about 20 minutes, my life changed forever. Uh, I never played hockey again. Um, How did that happen? Motorcycle accident, and it broke both my ankles and my wrists and compound compression of the spine. I was lucky to survive. Yeah. Uh, you know, I was in the hospital for eight months. Uh, I think it would probably be about three weeks these days, but what what were some of the things going through your head at that time, having just schmucked up your body and after having a promising uh, potential future in hockey? Uh, I was at a big loss, and it took me into uh, some things that I hadn't dealt with uh, in my life, and and many of us don't know what the traumas are that bring us to where we are, uh, and. Quite often people think, oh, you have the disease of addiction. Uh, my belief structure and my understanding and uh, the studies I've done uh, says it's not a disease, but it's a undealt with trauma. Yeah. So do you think that that was your first trauma that kind of set you on a, a different road? No, as I found out from Dr. Gabor Mate, it was probably at birth because uh, I was born a two-pound, six-ounce kid, 27 inches long. Uh, my mother had had a... Uh, problem with toxemia and she threw up for six months of the pregnancy and I came out skinny and uh, no, hungry, no. Hungry, no. hungrier <laughs> than a bear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so what happened after you rehabilitated yourself from that accident? Well, I never did uh, finish high school. I'm, I left high school with a few credits owing and, and just uh, by the age of 15 I was trafficking. Um, you were trafficking I, drugs? Uh, yep. And by the age of, of 19, I'd been arrested. I never finished high school because of, you know, being high too often. And uh, I just went on from there. I worked around the music business as a roadie and uh, with a local band that's pretty well known. 
Um, they were the first in the Blues Hall of Fame uh, about two years ago. And uh, they've done a couple of fundraisers for Clean Scene, the organization I run. And uh, I look back at it, and at 18, I was moving equipment around and selling drugs. And uh, at 19, I got arrested for uh, 13 pounds of hash and uh, thought I was going to go to jail for 8 to 10 years and uh, ended up in court, and the bag had gone from fairly large to a little tiny bag of uh, what turned out to be six and a half ounces, and I was finally convicted of simple possession of several ounces of hash. In those days, anything over 10 grams, you would have got charged with trafficking, but they made a deal with me, and I pled guilty not realizing I could have walked away scot-free because of chain of evidence. Huh. What happened after that? Like, where... Well, that was just the start to the end of a new beginning. Well, but, uh, yeah, at 19, uh, after a few more events with the Edmonton City, City Police, I left town. I moved to Vancouver, uh, lasted there about a year and a half, and ended up out in Montreal. And my life uh, transformed again into you know, from just trafficking drugs to smuggling drugs. So I, I started traveling to places like Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Nepal, and then uh, after one of our loads got busted, um, I decided that hash was too bulky. <laughs> and so I moved on to cocaine. <laughs> and cocaine was smaller and made me more money. So uh, I was doing that and up until uh, 1980 when I got arrested for half a pound of cocaine here in Edmonton at the end of a run and uh, got sentenced to three years. Three years, fed time. Fed time, first time. Fed, first time, fed time. How did that go? Uh, well, broken cheekbone and broken jaw, um, 12 broken ribs. Uh, that was my first week in federal pen. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're here now, though, so you made it. Well, I learned how to survive in, in jail. And um, um, I've served two sentences. The second one was a lot longer. I've done about eight and a half years of my time, but I've been sentenced to over 15. And uh, What was your second pen bit for? My second pen bit was for armed robbery. And uh, so uh, after the first time, nobody trafficked with me anymore. So I kind of got pushed to the side and and uh, I needed money, so I found myself walking through the door of a few banks and some rob uh, jewelry stores, and and uh, I was finally charged with three armed robberies. I was guilty of a whole lot more, and uh, I was convicted of one. And yeah. the uh, courts are sort of a situation where they don't always get to the truth of the matter, and lawyers and, and people... Uh, can pull you out of the crap hole that you put yourself into. And so I probably would have served a good 15 years if I'd been convicted of everything I did. Um, but they still tried to whack me because they knew I was, I'd done more than they could convict me of. So I, I was sentenced to 12 years and lived uh, about 23 months in the Edmonton Remand Center downtown. Um, the old Edmonton Remand Center. Oh, yeah. Which is disgusting and creepy and probably haunted. Well, I don't know if it's creepy and haunted. I'm not one of those who believes in the <laughs> idea of haunting, but uh, it was a s sick place. Um, but I, I'd say it's less uh, dehumanizing than the current one. Uh, is the, the current one, there is no option for face-to-face uh, -face visits with family. Uh, yeah, definitely. I've experienced that. Yeah. Now, uh, in, in the new Edmonton Remont Center, in the jail there, uh, are all visits are done over a TV screen, and they're only 15 minutes long. Yeah. So it's pretty pretty oh, harsh. I think that's pretty dehumanizing. You know, human, humanity uh, is taken away from us in many ways in, in the correctional settings, and we want to get people back to living and not uh, surviving in jail. Um, Absolutely. So... At the end of uh, about five years, I uh, came out of jail last time, and I was tossed into Hope Mission uh, as a halfway house, and they had a parole set up in the upstairs. 
And uh, one of my, my sponsor in the program I was in at the time, he turned around and he said, uh, well, they threw the lion in with the Christians because uh, I was quite the jerk to, to most of the people there. Oh, wow, Mike. Why were you jerks to the people there? <laughs> well, you know, religion's one of those things that some of us believe in and some of us don't. And yeah. at the time, I was, was anti-everything that I could be in my life and just couldn't see any point to it. And I kept getting told I had to go down and say my prayers, and I wasn't a prayer kind of guy. Yeah, well, to each their own, right? Some, yeah. I think is. Me personally, I have a I have a strong belief in the intangible things, the things I cannot see. But I uh, I don't hold myself to any religion. And, and and Justin and I have talked about had that conversation on here before. But uh, so when you got out of the pen and you started to make this shift in your life and you started to make changes, like how did that happen? Where did that come from? And uh, what was the initial things that you got yourself into in regards to community work that has brought you to where you are today? Well, I ran into a twelve step programs in the in the joint first time and second time the first time uh, I got physically thrown out for talking about drugs um, and so I had an attitude problem um, second time I was in there was now a, another program for guys with drug problems and um, I went to the program with the idea I'd, I'd get out of jail and so that's the way it was I wasn't very sincere about what I was doing and when I got out of jail on, on day parole, um, I ran into my sponsor who became my friend of 35 years and reality changed in my life. And now I went through that period uh, and, and actually thought I'd found the way with the program. And uh, for eight years, it was something I did almost every day. And that was that was twelve step uh, Narcotics Anonymous. Actually, we press, radio, and films were not supposed to say anything. But I'm I'm not in the program anymore. So, yeah, it was. And and I, I did things like started the service office Narcotics Anonymous, and wrote the bylaws. And the problem I ran into was um, a lot of the people called us the Board of Twisties. And, you know, it was put-downs for organizing because I was the social convener for a while, and so I threw the dances, and, and I was the only guy who owned a house. And and the reality was is uh, if, the, if the place burned down from all the smokers, you know, the yeah. and tobacco was a big problem, and I used to be the guy in the program who said... Uh, tobacco's a drug you better quit otherwise you're not straight and clean and some of the people didn't like my comments and sort of treated me like I was the smoking Nazi <laughs> <laughs> um so you're saying NA uh like you're on a board with NA and you helped get the initial program started here in Edmonton and then what no, happened? No, uh, I came in it was already started what we did was started the service office narcotics and oh, okay okay and uh, the first one in Canada um, yeah I was involved in the service structure and I gave back to the community because that's what my sponsor said to me he says give back for what you get and, and so I was deeply involved when I left NA uh, I, I, and walked out of the program uh, I walked into a different part of my life, and one of the people who helped me start Clean Scene later was the guy who introduced me to Rotary International, uh, the largest service organization in the world with uh, 1.3 million members worldwide and 33,000 clubs. Um, I've been in two clubs. Um, some people thought I shouldn't be in Rotary at the beginning because of because you used to rob banks. <laughs> yeah, and, and do all the things that are not supposed to happen in your life. And uh, But I've been in now 22 years, so of my 30 years clean, the first eight were in, in the 12 steps, and the, the last 22 have been in Rotary, and that's where I give back to the community. I'm a past president of my club, and um, I've been involved in, in all levels of service within Rotary. Uh, including doing stuff at the district level like uh, youth camps and, and other things. And um, how, how was that? How was doing youth camps? 
Well, I, I really enjoyed it because I got to teach kids some of the choices they were making were going to screw them up. Yeah. And uh, along the way, um, I was doing more things, and um, my, my uh, introduction to, to Rotary was through a guy named Chris, and Chris uh, said to me, Mike, why don't you turn this thing you're doing, because I'd been doing a lot of work in classes, and I've spoke to about half a million kids in schools across Alberta over the last uh, 25 years. About what? Drugs and crime. Um, how to get straight and stay straight, uh, how to make good choices in your life. Um, uh, I've been teaching about self-talk for since 95, so that would be like 23 years of teaching people how to uh, put those thoughts positively into their brain and use them every day. Is that something that you still practice today? Oh, absolutely. And, and I've got a new partner in, in Howie Hoggins, and Howie uh, is probably one of the other guys who's, he came to it in a very different way than me, and, and he's never been a drug user or a criminal. He's a former school teacher, but he and, l- learned from the same company as I did. And uh, so we've had Howie on the show before. The episode's called Hog Wild. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and uh, so so Mike and Howie uh, are working together now at Clean Scene, and uh, we won't get into the programs that that they're they're starting or anything right now because they're not officially started. But uh, what were uh, what were what was the most enjoyable things that you've ever done uh, in service work in the community through Clean Scene, like with youth? What are, what's the most memorable moments that you have where you really changed some kids' lives? Mm-hmm. Oh, um, a school I'm still working in or that and my staff are working in. Uh, we've been there for 18 years um, steadily uh, through two principals. The, the last one's been there for the longest. He's been 11 years there. And he, he's a great guy. He supports what we do. Uh, when we received a, a big award uh, two weekends ago, he was there. Um, He's one of those people who just uh, I find really positive, uplifting, and wanting to make a difference in, in with his kids. And he's he's just an exemplary person. Um, I found that you know some some schools are that way, some schools are different, and uh, I'm not going to pick school districts and and uh, just jump all over it, but. You know, education is something that's it's kind of stuck in a hundred-year-old system. In a little many, bit, yeah. And, yeah, and it needs some growth and, and movement forward. So evolution, every, just like well, us. Well, n- not every kid's the same. No, you know, absolutely not. Because you got about a seven to ten percent group that are like I was, and you've got uh, kids that don't get into trouble, and um, and yet they have some problems. And they learn how to get through them, where some of us just didn't give a rat's patootie what was going on and just kept blazing down the circle. And now it's legal, you know. So marijuana. And I, yeah, and I'm I look at that and I'm kind of neutral on it. I'm not for it and I'm not against it. Um, I think for adults they should make their own choices as to what substances they use, um, but. Young people, we're, we're dealing with develop, developing minds, and when you put substances into them, it really screws them up. And uh, I've seen so many of them that it's brought them to the point of psychosis and even schizophrenia. And, and a lot of kids don't believe it until they end up with it. Yeah, and then even the diagnosis, only they only get diagnosed when they're finally straight or getting straight in the hospital or something like that with the support of their families and by then the damage is done oh absolutely you know and uh, i won't use his name but a young man came into my my office at about 15 Uh, i worked with him for three years and i watched him uh, really crater deeply into into schizophrenia and it was really hard to watch and uh, his mom and uh I uh, built a relationship of support for him, and uh, it's it's always amazing. He was an amazing guitarist uh, prior to, after, nothing left. It took his talent. Well, it took all of the things that that were really good in his life and just took them away from him. 
and it's it's hard to watch. You know, working with the young people when there's a problem, uh, we find, or I find, I, I'm, I get a lot of emotions tied to it. So those those emotions come out in a lot of different things that I run into working with youth, because it takes me back to my youth as I, you know, the problems I dealt with uh, when I lost the ability to pay, play hockey. It, it hit me really hard and, and took me down deep. And I, uh, after that, I just didn't want to even see skates or, or any of the things that I went along. And, then, you know, I look at, at the world differently now, and I kind of enjoy hockey these days, and especially when the Oilers are playing well. Let's go Oilers. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, overall, it's, you know, the, the work that I get to do really takes me at, at a different level um, than what most people ever see. And I get a lot of parents who are, well, stop my kid from doing drugs. And uh, I just say, you know, the more you push them, the worse they're going to get into it. Yeah. Yeah. I, well, I'm a living example of that too. It's like my mom tr- fought tooth and nail to try to like steer me out of that. But uh, by the time she was pushing, I was pushing back and res- 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 resentment and like, no, like, I identified with it by then. We we all do that. You know, psychologically, when, we, when we're pushed by somebody else, we push back, even if it's verbal push. Now, when I was bouncing at one period in my time, you pushed me and I pushed back physically <laughs> and pretty harsh. And, you know, I'm, I've been through a lot of different things in my life, but um, the early teens were deep into drugs, um, hash, pot, LSD, uh, MDA, um, other hallucinogens, including peyote, and you know, and I just tried everything except for heroin. See, I knew heroin was addictive, and I wouldn't touch it. No, I, I don't really believe in addiction the way it's laid out, because the idea of a, it being a disease is, is, as far as myself and a couple other uh, theorists that I've studied and worked with. Uh, no, addiction isn't a disease. You may have mental change, or you may have actual physical change in your brain caused by uh, some drugs, and especially all the damaging cuts that are used. And th- that's a problem of the drug world. The cuts, the things that they buff it with, the buffing agents? Yeah. yeah. Especially heroin. Uh, all you have to do is look at Keith Richards from the Rolling Stones, and you see his hands are all crippled up. That's from chalk. Chalk and the heroin, because they melt at the same temperature. But that chalk, uh, when it solidifies in the body, it either cause, it can cause abscesses, blood clots, and, and it causes all kinds of problems with your joints. And uh, a lot of people don't understand why things happen, uh, you know, as far as the drug world. Uh, I've been reading and studying for a b- bunch of years. Um, being 30 years clean... Uh, only eight of it in a program, uh, a lot of people said, oh, you're going to fall back because you don't believe, um, you know. And I don't think it's a question of believing in a program. <coughs> it's believing in yourself. Yeah. And believing in that you have the strength to overcome. Uh, as I began to learn self-talk in the, in the early 90s, um, my life changed drastically again. And, and the step into uh, creating the future through affirmation processes and, and understanding self-talk and tying the two things together and then beginning to set goals in my life. And, you know, I kept getting to live for today, forget about tomorrow. Well, that's fine, but you need to put some goals into your life, things that will bring you forward. Yeah. And so I've never given up on, on goal setting and moving forward um, what what was it uh what was the determining factor for you when you decided to make that change from 12 step in AA or NA to go to something else Well I got invited by uh um, Chris who was a uh, guy who introduced me into rotary um and it was about 3 months prior to my leaving it in NA and and going on that path and uh, when it happened, it's 
I was uh, already doing a lot of speaking to Rotary clubs, um, and um, a lot of people were wide-eyed when I start talking about what I used to be and how I lived. Uh, they were kind of shocked. It was, and I still get that. You tell somebody that you used to rob banks, and they, they they get an instant reaction to you. Yeah, well, I guess, uh, including including the left hand governor a couple of weekends ago, who, who she says, "Wow, we need more people like you," and uh, I was kind of surprised that she'd say that. But you know, uh, who who is the left lieutenant governor? Lois Mitchell is is our current left lieutenant governor, and she's quite an amazing lady. And w- like, what is their role? Well, they're the Queen's representative in our parliamentary system. Oh, wow. Just like the Governor General in federal, you know, and Lieutenant Governor's provincial. Okay. So um, I've known two of them, um, Donald Ethel and uh, and Lois Mitchell. Um, I've done some speaking for the Lieutenant Governor's Circle on Mental Health and Addictions, and I, I do a lot of speaking uh, but at this uh, Award ceremony. I actually said outright that we need to find a new word to replace addiction because of its stigma. Yeah, it has a has an effect on people like going through substance abuse issues, and then all of a sudden they have this label they can throw on themselves as an addict, and it almost kind of holds you down into that position because, like, whatever you say that you are, you become, and you you see it kind of solidifies the future in your fate to say, hi, my name is Kenny and I'm an addict. Like that's a belief system that I have that that was a big deterrent for me to step out of AA and NA and find something else because I I didn't agree with introducing myself to the world every day or every time I went to a meeting and labeling myself as an addict. Because like if anything, what I started to do to make that shift was say, my name's Kenny and I'm gratefully sober. Uh, At least that brings some gratitude into it. And and at least that I, uh, I wasn't, dooming myself to the pits of hell and addiction with stating I am something. Well, I used to walk into the meetings and when somebody would ask me to share, I'd just say, hi, I'm Mike, I'm a recovering human being. And boy, did I get some a rough ride for doing that. Uh, you know, I got told to shut up a few times. And, um, you know, if you're not going to be uh, in the program, get out. And uh, my attitude was is, Really? You're stuck that much on some words? And, you know, the reality is, is an I am statement is an affirmation. I am because. Well, I am an addict? No, that's a really bad affirmation. Uh, It's just saying, it's just putting yourself down. Yeah. And so when I walked away from that, uh, I was busy working with... uh, a company out of the States, and uh, I thought I'd never, ever be able to travel again because I'm here I have a drug record and an armed robbery record, and, uh, you know, getting into the United States with those kinds of things is almost impossible. But uh, I started working for a company out of the States called the Pacific Institute, and they were teaching us this. And, uh, and the interesting part was is I got to learn from a couple of the world's top psychologists while working for them because they brought them in to teach us. Yeah. And so uh, I got invited to the first training for the company in, in, in 95. And uh, I'd gone out to the airport to get my, uh, try and get a pass to go to the States. And in those days, you didn't have to have a passport. You could literally go down there on your birth certificate. And uh, but when I went out to the airport, the guy laughed at me and said, "It'll never happen." He said, "Not with that record." And he, he says, "We've also got all kinds more information about you, so it isn't just your record." And, and no Canadian pardon works to get across that border. Uh, it, you have to have a an agreement with the U.S. government to get across that border once you've got that kind of record. So. I go down there, and about two weeks later, after going to the airport, I, I got a notice, we're going to give you a one-time pass for training because I said, look, my job is dependent upon this. Yeah. And so I, I got a one-time pass to go to uh, three days of training and then a, a three-day conference in Seattle. And as I was at the conference, uh, I was asked to speak about a project I was doing up here, and 
we had 15 kids from Lacklebish and who came to this and uh, it was really an exceptional conference but on the three days before uh, my boss to be uh, asked me to share a bit about who I was and where I came from and so I told him I wasn't shy about it and uh, I could see some reaction in the room and uh, but Lou was used to that he was my boss to be at the time and he'd had a guy named Gordy Graham who uh, has worked in the prisons up here too uh, with uh, Stephen Covey's group now and running the same program that he ran for the Pacific Institute and uh, so I'm I'm down there on the next day I first thing in the morning uh, Lou changed the the plan of the day on the conference he kind of did things the way he wanted it and so uh, what I got told was at about 8:30 that morning was that uh, I was going to do a 15 minute on our project and so I get up there on the stage, and Lou always had these big, comfy chairs, and he'd sit it behind you as you were talking, and you know, if he, he'd stop you and ask you a question. It's kind of like you and me doing this. Yeah. And uh, so uh, after I'd finished presenting, the kids actually honored me with a, a cartoon of me that one of the kids had drawn in the school, and it was pretty damn good. <laughs> and so it, underneath it said, Mr. Clean, and... On top of it says you can do anything you set your mind to. And uh, so I was kind of really taken by the cartoon, and I'm just about weepy at that point, and I was holding it back instead of letting it out, and, and then Lou pipes up and says, Now, Mike, tell everybody about yourself. <laughs> <laughs> and there were 800 people in the audience, and I was totally taken aback by that but I did a 10-minute little intro of who I was and where I'd come from and uh, what my life had been for the last uh, 20 years prior to getting clean. And uh, when I finished, I got a standing ovation. Nice. And I so, was, so getting clean for you is not just sober. It's getting clean for you is changing your whole life. Yeah, and you, you can't just get sober, you know, and, and, or to me... It's when do you begin to understand yourself? When do you really look at who you are every day and how you behave in public? Well, the interesting part was is that was the day I got permission to travel to the United States permanently because the speaker after me happened to be a guy named General Colin Powell. And uh, one of the guys who I'd met at the conference down there was a guy named Bernard Lofke. Bernard was... Uh, lieutenant general in the U.S. military, and uh, he'd worked in Central America, and, uh, and uh, he didn't like what they were doing. And he came to work at the Pacific Institute, and uh, he was working with the what is it? Mo not the militia. And they have another word for their uh, in-country uh, military personnel that don't go out of the out of the U.S. I don't know. What yeah. is. Anyway, yeah, he he had uh, come up and talked to me after my initial during the training and uh, said, that's really a big story. And so the next day, I, I didn't realize he was mentor to Powell. And uh, so he, as I'm leaving the stage, Powell's coming up the, up the stairs and he leans into me and says, how the hell did you get in the United States? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, I got a one-time permission. And I figured, oh, crap, that's it. You know, I'll never get in. And he turned around and said, well, we need more people like you around. Keep coming back. I'm going to make sure you do. And about three weeks later, I got a big envelope with uh, some documents and a pink card, like a credit card almost, and... Uh, with my picture on it, and uh, I wondered how they got my picture. <laughs> <laughs> but they had my picture, and, and it had wavy lines through it, so you couldn't copy it. You couldn't forge it. Yeah, and a really heavy piece of, and I've still got it today, and you don't dare lose it because you'll never travel in there again. Yeah. You know, so it's, I've got a permanent visa to the States, but border security always gives me the creeps because... 
I go in there and I put that card down and they'll usually say something like, you're a really bad guy. And, and I just say, you know, well, the first time was, uh, that was a long time ago. 25 years later it was, well, it was 25 years ago, you know, and, and I went to uh, into the States four times last year and one of them, uh, my coach in one of the programs I'm involved with, she she says, just treat it like water off the duck's back. Because I was really tired tired of the border cards and the behavior. And so I walked in there and I smiled and I handed her my card. And she looked at and typed something in and she turned around and she says, wow, you haven't done any crime in 30 years. <laughs> <laughs> and I was kind of surprised by it, but I thank you. You know, that's, that was one of those moments. So as I go through... In uh, last February, I went down to Honduras to go scuba diving, and and uh, one of my favorite things to do. And I, I recertified. Is, is scuba dive? Yeah, I started scuba diving. So when, the scuba well, diving is part of your self care program. Well, it is now. Back when I was in my twenties, uh, when I was uh, smuggling drugs, I I used to go down to the Bahamas and and go scuba diving, and uh, it would clean up my sinuses after stupid behavior. With you're co- sniffing a whole bunch of cocaine. Okay, yeah. <laughs> and uh, so, it, you know, the problem was you get down there deep enough, it'll actually push all the, the crap in your sinuses right out through into your well, mask. Well, there you go. Life hack for everybody out there sniffing coke. <laughs> if you ever need to clean your nostrils, just go scuba diving in the salt water. <laughs> so, yeah, it was uh, a period of time. Um, you know, I lost my wife in, in last November, and, and so I I wanted to go and do something, you know, take my mind off of what was going on. Yeah. And so I'm in, in Honduras scuba diving for, for 10 days, and, and the last day I went ziplined with some friends, and I tore my bicep off. And so I'm coming back, and I'm trying to carry everything with on one arm, and I, I can't even lift uh, my wallet. It was that bad yeah and uh so i put my my document i pulled it out and made sure i had it in my hands and put my document and my passport on the table and the guy as soon as he saw the the uh uh pink card he freaked out and called over some big security guy and next thing i know i'm in a room with about 45 refugees and some strange looking people who didn't look too healthy uh and uh so I sat in a chair as far away as I could go from everybody. And uh, I ended up missing my flight. And uh, finally, one of the guy, older guys called me over. He says, you're in transit to Canada? And I said, yeah. And I said, I, I don't know why I'm sitting here. And he says, well, it's this card. <laughs> he says, this guy's young, didn't know what it was, and he freaked out. You know, So uh, we apologize, and we'll help you get a hotel room for the night and catch a flight tomorrow so that was your first time in a jail cell in a while eh well i wasn't in jail (laughs) but it it was the next step to going into a jail cell yeah you You were detained detained that's exactly it now you know life brings you to those things even when you've been clean for 30 years yeah you know uh, to me it's it's not getting angry at that point and i kept my temper in check uh, and and it's one of the things I have to do on a regular basis because uh, I do have a bad temper if I let it out. Don't affirm it. I don't affirm it. <laughs> uh, I just say if I let it out. If yeah yeah. And uh, so today it's life is very different. But how did I get there? Well, I guess the twelve step helped in the beginning, but there was a lot I disagreed with right off the bat. You know, and I, I couldn't. I had a hard time with it. Yeah. Uh, the the programs that I see today is is I see a new one coming out shortly uh, on a regular basis that we're working on, uh, and it's it's well worthwhile because it takes you to hold that whole level of understanding affirmation process and and positive thinking, and how to stay there, and to stay regularly in it and working through it. You know, at, at my age. Uh, do I need to affirm that I'm going to be really healthy? Uh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> At any age. Um, yeah. You know, I, I had one just a short while ago where uh, when my wife passed, the, the insurance company said, well, 
uh, I asked them for a payout, and they said, no. Uh, we expect you're going to die soon anyway. You know, I'm, I'm 65. And they, th they think, and I'm going to die soon? So I told them, no, I'm going to live to be 95, and you're going to pay me way more than you had to. Uh, <laughs> and, <laughs> and so I can, I can be a bit of a jerk when I get going. But, you know, the reality is, is standing up to rules, and especially cruddy rules, you know, kids whose parents pass away, they give them the minimum payout, and it's over. And if they spend it too quick because they've got nobody there on it, suddenly they've got no, no financial support through a good portion of their lives. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a thing I'd, I'd like to see change. Yeah, for sure. So uh, where you're at today, and wh what about these awards, these Lieutenant Governor Awards that you're talking about? Why don't you explain that? Tell me about that. Well, I've had not just one award. I'm, I've got a Canadian Criminal Justice Award um, for the work I do in, uh, with young people and, and with the law in the courts. Uh, I do a lot of advocacy for young people in trouble with the law. And quite often we're, we're pretty officious in, in some of the rules we run as law uh, with young people. And uh, I think we need to step up and stand up for them. Uh, you know, locking a kid up is not a good and healthy thing to do oh yeah totally you know i know yeah if you commit a murder um you, you have to be away for the protection of society on the possibility you might do it again uh, but i'm what i learned in jail and in, in my time inside is is rarely do uh, guys commit multiples otherwise they're always doing them right off the, the hop and serial murders are different than the guy who commits a murder in the middle uh, middle of passion. But we treat them very much the same. Yeah. You know, we give them life sentences. And, uh, and if you've made the mistake of pissing off the justice system, <laughs> you're going to get a long sentence. You know, uh, most people don't know and understand uh, what life sentences are. You can get life ten. What it means is you're hooked for the rest of your life. Yeah, on, you're on parole for the rest of your yeah, life. Yeah, if you get parole. Yeah, you're you're never really free, and they can haul you back in an instant. So people say, "Well, you only got ten years." No, and and I have to say that the our our right wing organizations tend to love to say, "Oh, we're soft on crime." Well, I don't want to see life anything beyond life sentences, like capital punishment. No, I, I don't believe in it, and I think it's the worst thing you, you can do is once you threaten to kill somebody through the system. And what makes you any better than the guy that did the murder? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, and how many get killed who didn't do the crime? Because in the states, in the state of Texas, 27 people were murdered by the state who didn't do the crime. And uh, that's, that's the problem we run into is, is it's not infallible. Uh, the system I've worked around and, and been involved with, because I'm, I'm constantly in the courts uh, doing things, um, and working in the remand center with inmates and in a program we, we call uh, a second chance, uh, which gives them uh, a chance to go and get into treatment and find a way back from where they are. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to see lots of that. In fact, I think it would be a better idea than uh, locking them up for 20 months waiting to go to trial. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, heal them, heal while, them. They're, while they're innocent until proven guilty, yeah. even though that's kind of a, uh, no, well, I'm, a we, schmuck up of a phrase. We're, we're treating them like they're guilty till proven innocent. Yeah. And I'm, I have a problem with that. Um, the reality is, is I... I do get to go places that very few people do these days. Uh, but that's all about how long you've worked in the system uh, trying to make a difference. And uh, I work with a lot of lawyers, and uh, I give my time to a lot of, a lot of people. And as uh, you were one of them at one time. Still am. Uh, still are. Yeah. And, well, I think you're doing pretty darn good these days. Thanks, Mike. Uh, so, like, if you were to... Uh attribute your success in sobriety today t to one thing what would that one thing be human beings so giving back or helping other people helping others but also the people that help me 
Yeah. You know, because sometimes it's it's a guy sitting down and spending some time talking to you about what's going on, uh, and giving you a different point of view to or a different point to look from. Yeah. Uh, and I found myself coming out of things. Uh, I can say at about five years clean, I was still a pretty angry guy. Yeah. You know, uh, and I, I had a bad temper uh, that got in my way quite a lot. And uh, especially if somebody stepped in and, and pushed the right buttons, uh, I was a loose cannon. Um, somebody told me one day, man, you've changed. You're not the same guy. You're, you're soft. And I said, what do you mean? And he says, well, you're not just ready to rip somebody a new asshole. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. um, I was pretty much uh, that way for a long time. Haven't been a bouncer for about five years of my life. Uh, I worked in a well-known bar downtown, and uh, the Oilers used to hang out there. Right yeah. back in the Gretzky days. Yeah, yeah, those <laughs> in early eighties. Yeah, you know, and and understanding some of the stuff that went on back then, you know, uh, somebody'd want to get into a scrap and I'll tell you women are worse than guys when it, they go for the soft parts you know what I mean <laughs> the, the throat and eyeballs yeah, yeah my, well no the the other balls oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so I always used to have a bottle of seltzer water because nothing slows women down like getting wet <laughs> 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 and you know and, and I was a jerk back then so I wouldn't step back you know I also have all the scars that I carry. I'm, I'm kind of uh, embarrassed by my fists in, in, in the summers because all my scars show really well when they, my hands get brown because yeah. all the scars stay white. I have a thing called uh, vitiligo and another thing called alopecia. Drugs have some strange effects on human beings, and we never know what the, the cuts and all the stuff that's added to it is going to do. And we want kids to know you're not playing with something that is, you know, pharmaceutical grade. You're playing with something that's contrived, and it's dangerous, uh, and it can affect you long term. Uh, yeah, you know, the, even even marijuana does have some nasty side effects. Most people don't know about gynecomastia, and about two percent of all users who start using really early, uh, they end up with male boobs. And, uh, and not like, small ones. Like Bob off Fight Club. Mm, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You, you've seen them a few times they, in movies and other things. But the reality is is most, most of the young men who end up with that problem commit suicide because it's so hard on them emotionally. They get teased and ragged. You know, um, I get a lot of, a lot of young people that have done nasty things that I work with, and uh, they can't forgive themselves. And a part of it is your biggest thing is self-forgiveness. If you can forgive yourself for what you've done, you can begin the road back. And uh, it's what I found worked better than almost anything along the way. And I travel that every day as, as if, if I've been unfair to somebody, I'll, I'll go and apologize and, and want to make it right. Yeah. Um, I've, I've learned a lot about integrity and and authenticity in the last bunch of years of my life and uh, some other programs that I've taken that I, I really enjoyed some of the things that happened. Most of my staff have been through it. I think what, you're the only one that hasn't. <laughs> what, what program is that? It's called Landmark, Landmark Worldwide. And some people call it a cult. It's far from a cult because if it was a cult, they'd take all your money. Uh, yeah, it doesn't even come close. So what does that program teach you? How to use words properly. Most of us uh, are pretty sloppy in the way we use our words about ourselves and, uh, and about the way we treat others. Um, living in integrity means showing up on time. Yeah. Not five minutes late and oh, nothing to it. How do you affect others? Well, if you're late, then you slow everybody else down that's involved, and that's not very fair. No, it's not. Yet a lot of us are just inconsistent in the way we behave and not doing the things we should be doing. Um, so that program, one of the main f things of the program is integrity. Absolutely. Yeah. 
and authenticity is is learning to be the best you you can be every every day and being you not something that somebody else creates are, are you saying today you are being the best you possible every day now I do my best to be that, and you know I have my moments. Yeah, well, do or do not, or do do or do not, there is no try, and we nope. just do our best. Yeah, and doing our best is the best we can do, but give yourself the opportunity to do even better. Yeah, yeah. awesome, Mike. Well, I think that would be a good note to end the show on. We're almost running out of time. It was really awesome to have you here to share your story of uh, rehabilitation and reform and like talk about the work that you've done in the community. And uh, I appreciate you. Thanks for thanks for everything. And uh, I just want to f- finish up the show with, uh, you know, I, I want to let all the listeners know that I appreciate you guys as well. And that if you uh, check out our website, www.lifeonlifestermspodcast.com, you can uh, write us, you can subscribe, you can become part of the pride. And, and that's our tribe. You know, it's the Lion's Pride. We're here, we're making moves, we're getting things done, we're contributing to the positive flow of life and everything that we do, and uh, we just want to share that blessing and experience with all our listeners as well. So thank you for listening, thank you Mike for coming on, and we will be back, watch out for our next show. Have a good day y'all.